recognition. Time has expired. Mr. Speaker. Chairman, I seek recognition. The gentleman will the gentleman is recognized. I offer a motion to postpone to a date certain. I move to table the motion. Motion to table is heard and is not debatable. All in favor of the motion to table. All in favor of the motion. May we have the motion read, please? The, mo the motion was stated as to <laughs> adjourn to its date. May we have the motion read, please? The motion will be read as to what date? Motion to be read to a date, to date certain, Wednesday, December 11, 2019, so we can actually get a response to the six letters. The gentleman has stated his motion. The motion to table is made. Correct. Motion to table is made and not debatable. All in favor? The motion to table will say aye. 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 Opposed? No. The motion to table is agreed to. Roll call. Roll call is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Nadler. Aye. Mr. Nadler votes aye. Ms. Lofgren. Aye. Ms. Lofgren votes aye. Ms. Jackson Lee. Aye. Ms. Jackson Lee votes aye. Mr. Cohen. Aye. Mr. Cohen votes aye. Mr. Johnson of Georgia. Aye. Mr. Johnson of Georgia votes aye. Mr. Deutsch. Aye. Mr. Deutsch votes aye. Ms. Bass. Aye. Ms. Bass votes aye. Mr. Richmond. Yes. Mr. Richmond votes yes. Mr. Jeffries. Aye. Mr. Jeffries votes aye. Mr. Cicilline. Aye. Mr. Cicilline <clears throat> votes aye. Mr. Swalwell. Yes. Mr. Swalwell votes yes. Mr. Liu. Aye. Mr. Liu votes aye. Mr. Raskin. Aye. Mr. Raskin votes aye. Ms. Jayapal. Aye. Ms. Jayapal votes aye. Ms. Demings. Aye. Ms. Demings votes aye. Mr. Correa. Aye. Mr. Correa votes aye. Ms. Scanlon. Aye. Ms. Scanlon votes aye. Ms. Garcia. Aye. Ms. Garcia votes aye. Mr. Nagoose. Aye. Mr. Nagoose votes aye. Ms. McBath. Aye. Ms. McBath votes aye. Mr. Stanton. Aye. Mr. Stanton votes aye. Ms. Dean. Aye. Ms. Dean votes aye. Ms. McCarcel Powell. Aye. Ms. McCarcel Powell votes aye. Ms. Escobar. Aye. Ms. Escobar votes aye. Mr. Collins. No. Mr. Collins votes no. Mr. Sensenbrenner. No. Mr. Sensenbrenner votes no. Mr. Shabbat. No. Mr. Shabbat votes no. Mr. Gomert. No. Mr. Gomert votes no. Mr. Jordan. No. Mr. Jordan votes no. Mr. Buck. No. Mr. Buck votes no. Mr. Ratcliffe. No. Mr. Ratcliffe votes no. Ms. Roby. No. Ms. Roby votes no. Mr. Gates. No. Mr. Gates votes no. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana. No. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana votes no. Mr. Biggs. And Mr. Biggs we told you no. that you would get a constitutional no. crash course no. in constitutional no. law and impeachment no. earlier. Now you're getting a crash course in parliamentary no. procedure. No. Uh, Major Garrett, who's covered Congress with me, this is this is it shows how majority rules. Right, it, majority rules but the minority can interfere and slow down, block momentum. That's what these roll calls votes are decided to do. And when you call for a roll call vote, it must be recognized, you must go through the process. There is no other way around it. The minority knows that, the majority knows it. You try to do it as speedily as possible to regain momentum. That's what the Democrats want to do, block momentum. Chop things up. That's what Republicans are trying the, to do. The political effort is some just some pretty damning testimony from Noah Feldman, a former Rhodes Scholar, Harvard Law professor, about what the president has been accused of doing and why it may constitute an impeachable defenses. In his mind, it's unambiguous. The case is clear. De Republicans will say he is a Democrat who is, or a Democrat-oriented law professor, and they will try to undercut him. Let's listen in now to Pamela Carlin. Uh, and once under the leadership of Chairman Conyers. It was a great honor for me to represent this committee because of this committee's key role over the past 50 years in ensuring that American citizens have the right to vote in free and fair elections. Today, you're being asked to consider whether protecting those elections requires impeaching a president. That is an awesome responsibility. But everything I know about our Constitution and its values and my review of the evidentiary record, and here, Mr. Collins, I would like to say to you, sir, that I read transcripts of every one of the witnesses who appeared in the live hearing because I would not speak about these things without reviewing the facts. So I'm insulted by the suggestion that as a law professor, I don't care about those facts. But everything I read on those occasions tells me that when President Trump invited, indeed demanded foreign involvement in our upcoming election, he struck at the very heart of what makes this a republic to which we pledge allegiance. That demand, as Professor Feldman just explained, constituted an abuse of power. Indeed, as I want to explain in my testimony, drawing a foreign government into our elections is an especially abu uh, serious abuse of power because it undermines democracy itself. Our Constitution begins with the words, we the people for a reason. Our government, in James Madison's words, derives all its powers directly or indirectly from the great body of the people. And the way it derives these powers is through elections. Elections matter, both to the legitimacy of our government and to all of our individual freedoms, because as the Supreme Court declared more than a century ago, voting is preservative of all rights. 
So it is hardly surprising that the Constitution is marbled with provisions governing elections and guaranteeing governmental accountability. Indeed, a majority of the amendments to our Constitution since the Civil War have dealt with voting or with terms of office. And among the most important provisions of our original Constitution is the guarantee of periodic elections for the presidency, one every four years. America has kept that promise for more than two centuries, and it has done so even during wartime. For example, we invented the idea of absentee voting so that Union troops who supported President Lincoln could stay in the field during the election of 1864. And since then, countless other Americans have fought and died to protect our right to vote. But the framers of our Constitution realized that elections alone could not guarantee that the United States would remain a republic. One of the key reasons for including the impeachment power was a risk that unscrupulous officials might try to rig the election process. Uh, now, you've already heard two people give William Davy his props. Um, you know, Hamilton got a whole musical and William Davy is just going to get this committee hearing. But he warned that unless the Constitution contained an impeachment provision, a president might spare no efforts or means whatsoever to get himself reelected. And George Mason insisted that a president who procured his appointment in the first instance through improper and corrupt acts should not escape punishment by repeating his guilt. And Mason was the person responsible for adding high crimes and misdemeanors to the list of impeachable offenses. So we know from that that the list was designed to reach a president who acts to subvert an election, whether that election is the one that brought him into office or it's an upcoming election where he seeks an additional term. Moreover, the founding generation, like every generation of Americans since, was especially concerned to protect our government and our democratic process from outside interference. For example, John Adams, during the ratification, expressed concern with the very idea of having an elected president, writing to Thomas Jefferson that, you are apprehensive of foreign interference, intrigue, influence. So am I. But as often as elections happen, the danger of foreign influence recurs. And in his farewell address, President Washington warned that history and experience prove that foreign influence is one of the most baneful foes of Republican government. And he explained that this was in part because foreign governments would try and foment disagreement among the American people and influence what we thought. The very idea that a president might seek the aid of a foreign government in his re-election campaign would have horrified them. But based on the evidentiary record, that is what President Trump has done. The list of impeachable offenses that the framers included in the Constitution shows that the essence of an impeachable offense is a president's decision to sacrifice the national interest for his own private ends. Treason, the first thing listed, lay in an individual's giving aid to a foreign enemy. That is, putting a foreign enemy's adversary's interests above the interests of the United States. Bribery occurred when an official solicited, received, or offered a personal favor or benefit to influence official action, risking that he would put his private welfare above the national interest. And high crimes and misdemeanors captured the other ways in which a high official might, as Justice Joseph Story explained, disregard public interests in the discharge of the duties of political office. Based on the evidentiary record before you, what has happened in the case today is something that I do not think we have ever seen before. A president who has doubled down on violating his oath to faithfully execute the laws and to protect and defend the Constitution. The evidence reveals a president who used the powers of his office to demand that a foreign government participate in undermining a competing candidate for the presidency. As President John Kennedy declared, the right to vote in a free American election is the most powerful and precious right in the world. But our elections become less free when they are distorted by foreign interference. What happened in 2016 was bad enough. There is widespread agreement that Russian operatives intervened to manipulate our political process. But that distortion is magnified if a sitting president abuses the powers of his office actually to invite foreign intervention. To see why, 
Imagine living in a part of Louisiana or Texas that's prone to devastating hurricanes and flooding. What would you think if you lived there and your governor asked for a meeting with the president to discuss getting disaster aid that Congress has provided for? What would you think if that president said, I would like, to do you, I would like you to do us a favor? I'll meet with you and I'll send the disaster relief once you brand my opponent a criminal. Wouldn't you know in your gut that such a president had abused his office, that he'd betrayed the national interest, and that he was trying to corrupt the electoral process? I believe that the evidentiary record shows wrongful acts on that scale here. It shows a president who delayed meeting a foreign leader and providing assistance that Congress and his own advisors agreed serves our national interest in promoting democracy and in limiting Russian aggression. Saying, Russia, if you're listening, you know, a president who cared about the Constitution would say, Russia, if you're listening, but out of our elections. And it shows a president who did this to strong arm a foreign leader into smearing one of the president's opponents in our ongoing election season. That's not politics as usual, at least not in the United States or not in any mature democracy. It is instead a cardinal reason why the Constitution contains an impeachment power. Put simply, a president should resist foreign interference in our elections, not demand it and not welcome it. If we are to keep faith with our Constitution and with our republic, President Trump must be held to account. Thank you. Thank you, Professor.